Awesome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Sarah Wanachak. I'm on the Committee for Theorizing the Web. Uh, on Twitter, I'm also Sunny Moraine. It's my author name, so if you see that person and you're wondering who the hell they are, that's me. Uh, one of the reasons why that is who I am on Twitter, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this panel, is I'm also a fiction writer. I write science fiction and fantasy in addition to being a, an, in academia. Uh, and the, every, pretty much every single one of these presentations is something that I'm either kind of academically involved in, fandom involved in, or just think is super cool. Uh, so before we actually it looks like we're not having a problem with that but just I feel like I need to announce this anyway uh, for fire code reasons there shouldn't be any standing back there unless somebody is going to only be there for a couple minutes so everybody needs to be sitting down uh, and it looks like everybody's done a good job kind of moving forward and moving in awesome you guys are super organized uh, so yeah like I said I'm a fiction writer I'm also an academic uh, I've written a lot on just fiction in general, traditional written fiction. I've written on video games. Uh, I've written on film. So one of the things that I'm so interested in about uh, kind of how contemporary storytelling is working is the things that digital technology and uh, especially digital technology that uh, helps people to work collaboratively the kinds of storytelling that that is making possible because I think that if you're a storyteller, regardless of what kind of stories you tell, this is one of the most exciting times to be doing that. Uh, and again, especially because there is a kind of collaborative storytelling possible in a way that I don't, it's not that collaborative storytelling is new, but I think it's possible in a way that it wasn't before. Uh, and that leads to, among other things, a kind of remixing or various forms of cultural resistance, which we're gonna be talking about. Uh, that I think is really neat and especially important right now. I think poignantly important in a way that it wasn't before. Uh, this makes possible kinds of self-narrative, stuff that's sort of fictional but sort of non-fictional. You know, our stories about ourselves kind of weave those two things together. Uh, in particular, fan fiction and fandom. And one of the things that I think is important about that is that that's kind of stigmatized, but I think that that's where some of the coolest stuff is happening, has been happening and is happening now. Uh, things like Twine Games, which I think is a kind of uh, sort of hypertext, very complicated, moving in a lot of different directions storytelling where, I mean, to be honest, I, some of the best stories I've seen recently have been Twine Games. So it's cool that people are starting to pay more attention to that. Uh, ARGs, alternate reality games, a lot of cool stuff happening there too. And uh, a couple of the things that I've gotten most excited about, re about recently, podcasting. The idea of radio drama becoming a thing again, which I never would have anticipated. Uh, things like Night Vale, things like Alice Isn't Dead, things like uh, Black Tapes Podcast and Tannis. Uh, some of the best horror fiction I've run into recently has been on podcasts. Uh, things like the Interface series, which is essentially a novel that was written in Reddit comments that people found and put together into kind of an ebook. but. It's, it's, again, it's really strange, it's really creative, it's something that couldn't have existed before something like Reddit happened. And one of the reasons why I think this is so important right now, it's not just about resistance and it's not just about people creating their own stories and putting themselves into stories that are already existing in a way that wasn't possible before, but what the question of what stories even mean and what is a story, I think, is in itself a really interesting question and is something that people are having a chance to examine and talk about and work with in a, in a way that I think is not, again, necessarily new, but really cool. And through these stories and through a lot of the ways in which they're being told right now, we can see sort of the construction of new forms of mythology. And one of the reasons why myths are so important is that myths tell us who we are. Myths are stories about the foundational elements of not just our culture, but about who we are as people. So I, I think storytelling is one of the most important things ever, and I think that these are all some of the reasons why it's not only important, but really exciting right now. All right, uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Monica Torres. Uh, is a journalist living in Brooklyn, New York, and her presentation is Race Bending Toward a Better Future, How People of Color Are Putting Themselves into Stories They Were Written Out Of. So, like I just said, Grace Sloan is an experimental filmmaker, prop master, and former projectionist with an unshakable love of the movies. Her, her academic interests include social media as both extensions of ourselves and film photo traditions, and Hollywood films as political and cultural reflections. And her presentation is going to be Hollywood's evolution of human good versus robot evil. Cynthia Hua is a creative technologist interested in internet video. Her background includes work experience at Hulu, BuzzFeed Motion Pictures, and Facebook Video 
where she has analyzed how systems for media distribution shape the creation of content. And her presentation is going to be Screens on Screen, Black Mirrors and Other Filmic Narratives of Technology. And finally, Stephanie Monahan is an illustrator and youth culture researcher for MTV. Her background is in American studies and gender and sexuality studies, but these days you can find her lurking around the Spectacle Theater in Brooklyn and co-running Heinous Materials Tapes, a spoken, spoken word horror cassette tape label. And her presentation is, It Could Look Like Someone You Know, Trauma Haunting, and the Impossibility of the Post-Human in Modern Horror Films. And with that, I'm going to get out of the way, and Monica, go ahead. My name is Monica Torres, and I'm here to explain race bending, or why a fan was compelled to Photoshop John Cho onto the poster of a movie that starred Matt Damon. Through a process known as race bending, fans are responding to all white casting notices by imagining people of color back into the stories they were written out of. It's a clap back to whitewashing. By tapping into the social, communal, responsive nature of internet fandom, fans are able to use all the online tools at their disposal fan fiction, GIFs, fan art, and Photoshop, Photoshop stills like this one to, spray it, to spread um, race-bent visions of better, more realistic worlds. Race bending is a term that was coined by activists in 2010 to protest whitewashing in the last Airbender film. For those not familiar, this is a bad film. Based on, <laughs> <laughs> based on a good Nickelodeon animated TV series. The TV show acknowledged that The Last Airbender was set in a fantastical Asian world, but the film's casting choices did not. The only reason Dev Patel even made the list is because white pop singer Jesse McCartney dropped out as the villain Zuko. This prompted activists to create racebending.com, a site to document and protest bad race bending. They defined the term as any situation where the race or ethnicity of a character gets changed for a role. Racebending.com focuses on the whitewashing aspects of race bending. Casting white people to play real and fictional people of color is an enduring Hollywood discriminatory practice that sends a dehumanizing message the default voice for stories is still a white one. It says that pe white people can play a person of color better than a person of color can. Inspired by racebending.com, it's activism, other fans decided to protest this erasure by filling in the gap. They flip the script on race bending. This is the part that I'm going to be focusing on. The administrators behind the Dream With blog Dark Agenda, an online community for fans of color, created the Race Bending Revenge Challenge. It is the most creative fan fiction exchange on race I've ever seen. Race Bending Revenge asks writers to race bend or rewrite a white character as a person of color. In a fan fiction of at least 500 words, with some acknowledgement of how that racial difference would make a difference to the story being told. It's the last part that was key. This wasn't gonna be colorblind storytelling. Unlike Hollywood race bending, this challenge understood that the key to good storytelling is a character's relationship to power. Like, what is this person's relationship to authority? And how does that change with their skin color? In writer Danielle Jose Older's guideline on how to write about race, he explained that creating this context to power means acknowledging the microaggressions and hate crimes, body image, life-changing decisions, everyday annoyances, and depth of historical community trauma. Those nuances are what make a story a story and not just propaganda. So, how would a brown Sherlock Holmes need to approach strangers' doors to solve crimes? What if Superman had been taken in by the Kents in 1930s Kansas? How would a Latina Buffy feel about a town that thinks she's part of a gang? These are all thorny questions around power that submissions to the challenge wrestled with. My favorite fan fiction from the challenge, Imagine Bucky, superhero Captain America's sidekick as Nisei. By making the sidekick to a World War II comic book hero, a child of Japanese-born immigrants, the story deconstructs and critiques the jingoism behind Captain America's premise. This historical world building is what fan fiction encourages writers to do. Fan fiction writers are making transformative works that are working off of an original text. 
you already going you already go in knowing the plot and the characters. The plot is beside the point. Fan fiction taps into the pleasure of rereading or closing the end of a book wanting more. Now that I'm not pressed about what happens next, I can now ask what happens if. Like, what happens if the magical world of Harry Potter had more people of color? A 2015 video called Every Single Word Spoken by a Person of Color in the entire Harry Potter film franchise by Dylan Marin showed the lack of representation in this eight film movie franchise by its brutally short length, six minutes, 18 seconds. Those six minutes, 18 seconds show that persons of color are largely irrelevant and invisible to the narrative that's supposed to mirror our own. This is an ongoing problem in this universe. After hearing that the latest Harry Potter film, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, is set in like 1920s New York and was going to star yet another white dude as the lead, I read one fan on Tumblr say she was going to make fan fiction in response because in Harry Potter, quote, the world begins and ends with straight white Christians and I am tired. So seeing fan-created visions of Harry Potter worlds set in the 1920s Harlem Renaissance is a way to give back and restore those lost voices. Race bending embodies media theorist Henry Jenkins' claim that fan fiction can repair the damage done in a system where contemporary myths are owned by corporations instead of owned by the folk. Exposing the structured absence of people of color in media by fixing it yourself becomes a written or visual indictment on behalf of every person the original creators failed to include. The race bending revenge challenge is over, but you can see its influence on Tumblr with posts that have thousands of notes tagged hashtag race bending. It's here that I'm reminded that the power of race bending not only comes from the work itself, but also from the conversations, debates, and community that fandom facilitates around them. Here's the life cycle of one such combo. A person posts a Tumblr gift set of superhero Tony Stark as a black man. Great. The gift set alone is a convincing argument. Using the power of repetition, a gift, a gift loop hypnotizes you into thinking that the footage of actor Aldous Hodge and the superhero Iron Man are one and the same. A gift persuades you into believing into more than the sum of its parts. But it gets better. That idea becomes a story. That gift set then gets reblogged with a different user's speculation of that race bent character's entire emotional backstory. Hashtag, oh my god, I'm automatically a million times more interested in rich, kind of dickish superheroes when they are POC TBH. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because like, imagine being a little black boy growing up so, so, so smart and so, so, so alone. That commentary then gets expanded and endorsed in a, another reblog. Hashtag, god, yes. You just never see POC in that kind of archetype. Tony Stark is a power fantasy reserved for white men. Fandom actively encourages fans to invest themselves into characters with this effective engagement. Unlike other models of discourse that emphasize objectivity or distance, fandom is all about the feels. How deeply can I understand this person's relationships, what drives them, their ambition, their sex life, those interpersonal institutional contexts? For marginalized fans, that's what's great about race spent fandom. You're actively encouraged to create and inhabit new worlds so that you can make intimate connections with original texts that may otherwise not include you. But not all examples of internet race bending are born explicitly from the subculture of fanfiction fandom. This past May, an example of race bending, hashtag starring John Cho, went mainstream on Twitter. William Yu photoshopped Korean-American actor John Cho onto movie posters as white male leads as a visual critique of the lack of Asian-American representation. Out of the top grossing 100 domestic films in 2015, there are no Asians in leading roles. John Cho himself endorsed the hashtag, but as with all fandoms, he said he knew that it wasn't about him, but what he represented. Fans use celebrities as digital avatars to project their own fantasies, hopes, and anxieties onto their bodies. Because their likenesses are everywhere, using celebrity images is the go-to way to create race-spent gifts and fan art. I believe that race-spent revenge and hashtag starring John Cho are not one-offs, but are showing us where race spending could go next. Race spending is born out of resistance, and it needs original works to push and pull against. 
As long as there are whitewashed works, race bending is here to stay. The vocabularies of what to call it may change, the tools of how to do it may change, but it will remain a way for fans to critique the structured absence and token presence of race in media. Race bending offers alternate universes to critique our own in the hopes that these head canons may one day become canon. And I believe that goal is possible. James Baldwin once said, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you alter, even by a millimeter, the way that people look at reality, then you can change it. I want a future where we can consume stories that better reflect and recognize our own lived realities. These race-bent fan fictions and fan art are incremental, yet impactful steps towards that future. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Hey there. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, my name is Grace Sloan. Sorry, let's start there. Uh, and I'll be talking about robots throughout uh, Hollywood history. Let's see if I can make this GIF work. Oh, no. Let's see. Sorry. Oh, are no GIFs working? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Technical difficulties. There we go. Uh, these are the evil us's, uh, the evil Bill and Ted's that are sent back in evil <laughs> Bill and Ted's uh, bogus journey to kill Bill and Ted, uh, which I just thought was a nice introduction to evil robots. Uh, so Hollywood films are our modern mythology, and while analyzing each film is a wonderful act in itself, today I will be looking at films across genres, across qualities, uh, to find common thematic ground and to hopefully shed light on how that culture might have been feeling at the time of that film's release. Uh, the, firm, the, ooh, the term robot was first used in a play called Rossum's Universal Robots in 1920, and uh, it was by a Czech writer. And since that very first instance, it's basically been the same story. We build a mechanic creature, it's often humanoid. Uh, they wake up, they try to kill us, and then we try to survive. Uh, this has been a very simple good versus evil story that has persisted to the uh, current, current day. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about what I call side robots, which are just uh, robots that aid in the either the protagonist or the antagonist. It is interesting that they often end up being maids, servants, uh, an anonymous police forces, or like Weibo and Flubber, who is literally a side robot as he tries to break up the marriage of his creator. Um, I've broken up the history of robots into six major uh, sections. The two major sections that I really, the most interesting major sections are, uh, or eras are the mid 80s through the early 90s and the late 90s through the mid 2000s. Uh, you'll see why soon. Uh, but I just want to touch briefly on before that. Uh, pre 1980s, there's a lot of uh, robot monster movies, literally robot monster where you have Roman. Uh, these are robots in traditional monster movie roles. So they are evil robots that humanity has to rally against. Uh, Gort from The Day the Earth Stood Still is a little different. He more acts as like a policing doomsday device. Um, the Daleks are traditionally evil. They were programmed to kill and destroy um, and conquer planets without remorse or any feelings. And Hal is the most, uh, you know, uh, well-known AI system who killed his crewmates uh, really as a uh, way they they suggest shutting him down because he starts to malfunction so it's a self-preservation technique to kill them uh, so it's evil by self-preservation which is also a very common robot theme then we get to the 80s um which are the best these are the kill bots uh from the uh film chopping mall uh <laughs> They, there's a huge, massive surge of robot movies between 1984 
1991. Um, it makes sense. Uh, new technologies are being developed. Mac in, uh, introduced the first personal desk desktop in 1984. Cellular services were starting to uh, come to be. Uh, Ronald Reagan, politically, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, introduced the Star Wars program, uh, which was a missile defense system. Uh, basically, the ideas of, of tech and global terror started to really come together around this time. Uh, uh, and that's why uh, robots become military and policing tools, particularly around the mid 80s. Uh, here you have uh, Short Circuit and Daryl, which are, are both uh, films about creatures that are made for, for military uh, needs. Uh, and it they're made to protect humans, but the threat of them going rogue and killing everyone is a constant threat in these films. And the solution to this, oh, sorry, Skynet uh, is a very, is one of the first examples of, of a very, very, very evil AI, uh, he, uh, which is in the film Terminator, of course, and uh, Skynet is a, a military uh, computer system that contr controls the nuclear arsenal. Uh, it becomes an AI, wants to self-preserve itself, and thus uh, creates the nuclear holocaust and then the Terminator program to destroy other uh, human life on Earth, which is where we get the Terminator. Uh, and the solution to these evil robots is to somehow imbue the robot with some form of humanity. Uh, not working for me. Uh, so uh, here we have the ED-209 seen here uh, in the boardroom meeting uh, killing uh, uh, one of the uh, board members uh, and the answer the answer to that is of course Robocop which is the cyborg version of the ED-209. Um, basically it's uh, ED-209 with a human in it. Uh, and sometimes uh, injecting humanity into robots is just a cultural thing. Why this is uh, by teaching by teaching the robots culture, you give it some sort of sense of humanity in hopes that it will value human life and then not kill us all. Uh, in in a short circuit uh, number five, first his programming is scrambled by lightning, which is also a very common theme, which is a carryover from the Frankenstein myth. Uh, lightning does everything to robots, makes them good, makes them evil, messes with them in all kinds of ways from the 80s and onward. Um, in Short Circuit, though, it isn't until after he meets Ali Sheedy, who uh, teaches him, there we go, uh, all, uh, gives him uh, books, TV, music, movies, and it's not until after then that he is a lovable, sentient robot. Uh, it's not a matter, also, all these human values uh, that we try to give to robots are all internal. It doesn't matter if the robot looks human in the 80s. Uh, this is uh, two very, very different filmic examples, but uh, in Deadly Friend, uh, the brain of a robot, BB, is placed into this dead girl, and BB immediately goes on a uh, rampage of killing because it didn't get a kill as a robot. And on the opposite side of that is, uh, and you thought your parents were weird, where the ghost of their father enters a robot, and then it's just a lovable robo dad, <laughs> voiced by Alan Thicke, perfectly. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's not about physical human materiality, it's all about internal human values. Um, but looking human, there's a, a great robo trope of uh, just humans bust, or robots busting out of humans. Uh, that I think is a, oh, none of these gifts are working, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so at the end of this era of the mid-80s, early 90s, uh, the Terminator 2 comes out and he comes back as a good guy, which is actually enormously shocking. Uh, the monologue that Sarah Connor has while watching the Terminator basically father her son, uh, uh, what, well, let me just uh, read some of it. <laughs> it's, uh, it would always be there. It would die to protect him. Of all the would-be fathers who came and went over the years, this thing, this machine, was the only one who measured up. And in an in insane world, it was the sanest choice. Uh, so the Terminator comes back as a good guy, only to be the father of John Connor and not the enemy of Sarah Connor, uh, who is John Connor's mother. Okay. Mid-90s, boring. It's only John Claude Van Damme, uh, cyborg movies and fembots. There's nothing really else here. 
Um, <laughs> all right, so then we get into the really interesting phase of the late 90s through the mid 2000s, uh, where you get an onslaught of just uh, these films. First, the robots are unique. There's always one robot that wakes up that is somehow mystically better than the other robots, um, and they try to be people in a way that's it's it's not imbuing it with like hu inner human values. They literally want to become people. Uh, Robin Williams in Bicentennial Man, uh, his name is Andrew in the film, literally at the end of the film injects himself with blood, which will eventually rot his system just so he can go to the like future equivalent of the UN and get human status. Uh, Robots are suddenly obsessed with being human. David from uh, AI, his whole thing is just a Pinocchio quest. He just wants to become a real little boy so his mother can love him. Uh, and we see more and more like that Iron Giant, which is an amazing movie. Um, I love Iron Giant. Uh, he is told he can be whatever he wants, and he chooses to be Superman, which is technically not human, but it's human plus. It's like a human, but more, and fighting for humans. Um... There's also a, a great, it's the true love's kiss trope is you, uh, sleeping beauty, you kiss her, she wakes up. And this works in robots too in that uh, the kiss is some form of human love that trumps technology. Neo is shot down by agents, but Trinity kisses him and suddenly he can control the matrix. It also happens, <laughs> it also happens in Inspector Gadget. He's dead in a uh, land uh, landfill. He gets a kiss uh, and... He suddenly doesn't need the, ch the control chip to make him work. His human heart was able to overcome his technology. Um, I'm not going to talk about iRobot, but it's a great uh, variety uh, uh, on the theme. There is a robot attack, but then at the end, sorry for spoiling it, you find out the robots just wanted to preserve humans so much that that's why they attacked them, because they were afraid the humans were just going to destroy themselves. Um, Isaac Asimov's Three Rules of Robotics, which is just basically robots can never harm anyone, extremely, extremely relevant to this phase of movies from the late 90s to the mid 2000s. Uh, from mid 2000s onward, just a lot of animation, not, alien robots, nothing that really sticks culturally except for Wally, of course, everyone's favorite robot, very based on short circuit. He has to tell humans that they used to be good. You know, he goes to space. They've let, they've destroyed the planet, and he has to remind them that they were once a great people to come back to Earth and to re, uh, you know, make that uh, happen again. Uh, he's he watches the movie Hello Dolly throughout the movie, which is uh, same like short circuit of just the human human knowledge and uh, human sympathy. Uh, the real a good uh, just illustration of how far we've come is a uh, RoboCop versus the RoboCop reboot. The first RoboCop, even though they're both technically cyborgs, the first RoboCop was he died. Alex Murphy died and then his memory was erased and then he was a robot who was remembering that he was a human. That is extremely different than the new version of RoboCop where he knows the whole time that he was a human. He has to immediately deal with his family after the accident uh, and this idea of if him being, he's not a robot. That's a cyborg, that's a robot. That's, that's the gist of it. Um, uh, sorry. Just more RoboCop shooting. Uh, Westworld is also a, just a very interesting uh, uh, comparison in that we do not sympathize with the robots in the original 1973 Westworld at all. There's only the Yule Brenner bot who uh, is evil from the get-go and as all of the robots go evil, he just gets more evil as opposed to uh, all of the characters in the new Westworld that we have tremendous sympathy for. Uh, and this just brings us to Blade Runner, which I didn't mention because I think it's too brilliant of a movie for any of these uh, thematic categories and I think it's really a question of what the new Blade Runner will bring that will define continue to define us as where we're at right now because I think that we are at another great period of robots uh we have another influx of robot movies with Ex Machina with Chappie of robots that are really determining life for themselves which they don't want to be humans they're robots, and they're going to figure out what that means for them. 
And I think that's very exciting. And that's all I've got, because I'm way out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, the guys in the back really don't want to have people standing, so if you can, like, kind of move them, or we don't really have any space. So, you know what? If a fire happens, just stand it out of the way. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia. Um, I was introed earlier, but so currently I work on video at Facebook. I've worked at a couple web media companies. Um, but before that, I studied film theory um, academically. And uh, this is, I guess, some research I did looking into how movies try to portray the internet in general. Um, and it's an interesting question because if you think of film as sort of the medium of the 20th century, uh, the internet is more or less the, the medium uh, through which we tell stories in the 21st century. So you have one medium trying to tell the story of the, the new one that's displacing it. Probably the most um, obvious example of that is Black Mirror. Um, that's the most, I guess, well-known well way that cinema and TV have tried to tell the story of the internet. Um, I think its title sequence is very interesting. If you remember the full title sequence, what happens after the Black Mirror title pops up is um, yeah, you have the screen sort of cracking. And um, it sums up quite nicely how in a lot of portrayals, um, a lot of stories where film and TV try to portray the internet, it really breaks up the traditional mode of film storytelling. So to go, um, to go back a little bit, in the 20th, for most of the 20th century, Hollywood developed a very uh, rote way of telling stories. There were all these rules. You went to film school, you learned how to edit movies and put them together in the same way. And all of that was basically to try and fool and convince you that what you saw on screen in like a movie or a TV is reality. So you learned all these things like for example, this is from 2001, A Space Odyssey. It's a famous case of visual matching between edits. Um, so to try to like uh, give you the illusion that what you're watching is real and not an edited film reel, you match what the last shot ended with with what the next shot begins with. So you see that with the bone here and the space shuttle. Um, and they did this in, ton there's tons of examples of, of matching between edits. Um, you have graphic matches, you also have sound bridges. There are all these little tricks that um, they'll teach you when, when you become a film editor and director to try and fool you into thinking there's only one perspective. It's the film camera. Uh, technology, however, I guess makes that a little more difficult because one of the things that technology does is it kind of breaks up the narrative. It allows you to have a story taking place in different places at different times. Um, that started happening already with the telephone. Um, so this is a, an early Hollywood movie. It's called Pillow Talk. And the whole premise is these two people, they talk on the phone every night and eventually they fall in love. Um, it, it kind of brought about this tricky situation where the film editor had to show two people at the same time on screen. So this was a very prominent initial use of the split screen. Um, but as you see, what they did here is they matched what um, visually matched the two sides of the split screen. So it kind of looks like one image. And actually, by the end of the movie, the, the couple gets together. So essentially, they've merged the split screen by the end of the image. So this was one example of a way that Hollywood is able to keep kind of its unified, single, linear narrative. Um, all this kind of falls apart, though, in the internet age, where most of the times when you tell a story, it involves dozens of people in dozens of places um, with all of their ind individual narratives happening at once. Um, so this is from a horror movie called Unfriended. And part of the, I guess, component of Unfriended um, that's supposed to be scary is you see a simulation of a computer screen where you have all these um, webcams happening at once and you never know when something's going to pop out. Um, so I thought today we'd look at a couple of the different problems of um, depicting the internet that films have been dealing with and how, how they're working through them. So as I kind of gave an example earlier, spatial and temporal fragmentation is one of them. Uh, you see this a lot in teen movies where teenagers will text at the same time that they are involved in another conversation. Essentially, like theoretically on a level, what's happening is you have the A plot and the B plot of a TV show and a movie occurring simultaneously. So this is from The Fall in Our Stars, which um, 
I thought was a cool big movie example of this happening. Um, there's like a romance in, in the movie, but the way that romance happens is a lot of it happens over text message and it happens over different times in the day um, and while the characters are not actually together on screen. Also, um, Mindy Project is a good example too. <laughs> um, I thought this was a funny example because what was happening here is I guess there was technically a sort of romance plot line, but someone had stolen her phone. So because of all this temporal and spatial fragmentation, um, you had the like almost the illusion of two characters coming together and they didn't actually in the end. Um, and then here's a here's a cool clip from Sherlock of on the screen you have tons of reporters getting the same text message at once. So it's like, where exactly do you look? The next tricky thing that films have to deal with is a lot of our experience of the internet is very um, internal and virtual. Like we sit in front of a laptop alone most of the times when we're online and that makes it very difficult to make movies about, um, about computers. And you see that a lot in movies about uh, hackers like The Social Network being a very like mainstream example. It's, it's hard to make it very exciting to watch a person just type on a computer for a long period of time. So something movies do is um, they'll they'll go very surrealist and uh, they'll make the internet like external um, by making sort of a, a fantasy version of it that doesn't really exist to the character that's in the character's mind. So um, in the fifth estate that happens, they're technically I think like in a network, um, whatever that means. But you, what you see on screen is this whole range of um, kind of surreal looking cubicles. And they also do that through animation. So I really love this movie. Um, it's called The World. It came out a couple years ago from Asian director Jia Zhang Ke. And it's a very sort of um, realistic movie as you see on the, on the right side. Um, but it's intercut with highly sort of like fake looking animations whenever the characters are like texting or having like, um, or going online or like using using internet communication devices. And obviously you see that in things like like Avatar. I mean, um, I think there's a lot of movies now kind of obsessed with virtual reality. And part of the reason is when you have a character go into virtual reality, you don't have to deal with that problem of them um, experiencing something in their own heads anymore. And then finally, the last thing that they do, which is something they used to teach you not to do in film school, is they have to add on layers of exposition. Um, so this is from Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot is quite well known for having a voiceover the whole time. Um, exposition for a long time was kind of frowned upon for filmmakers. You wanted to show, not tell. But when you have someone who's experiencing something virtually, you have to start um, exposing again through visual cues, through sound over, through here you have um, text overlay in Sherlock. Um, and this leads me into my next point of the third thing um, in addition to fragmentation and um, virtual experiences that you see with movies about the internet is a lot of mixed media. Um, so that's a clip from The Social Network where you're actually seeing a computer screen and what you notice about the this Facebook screen is it's got text and uh, design and photos uh, at the same time. And um, as I mentioned before, so what you get is sort of a return to the linguistic on screen, um, which is interesting because film and photos were initially seen as, oh, this is a step forward from the way we tell stories through the word, but suddenly it's, it's back to telling things um, through text. And here I just have a whole um, series of various examples of texting and TV shows. And you don't realize you're watching these TV shows, you think you're passively sort of engaged, being entertained, but you're also, you have to do the work of reading on screen, which um, hasn't happened for a long time. Um, and then finally, I guess, the all this sort of cu culminates in, um, in a sort of information overload. Um, and by that I mean you notice in a lot of film and TV about the internet that there's a lot, there's too much information to be shown on screen at once. So what you end up getting on the single film screen is a sort of shorthand. And that speaks to the idea um, that ultimately film is, I think it's, its edges are being pushed a little bit. And you see the traditional modes of storytelling in that medium being strained by how much, um, how many new things they have to represent in the age of the internet. 
Um, so this is like a good example from Sherlock where he has a dozen laptops out at once. Um, you assume because of all the visual cues, because of the narrative context that um, he's researching and finding solutions and answers, whatever, on, on all these screens at once. But of course, like you don't actually see what, what he's going through. You don't see his searches. He becomes sort of a, a translator. So like a good example is Modern Family, right, is typically kind of a traditional um, one camera sitcom. Um, but they did one episode where it was called Connection Loss, and the whole thing was on a laptop screen. So you can starkly, like, you can see the difference very much between, like, a, a story that's told this way and a story that's told this way. Um, and you can also see, so I, I bring up Sherlock again, because I think it's a very interesting comparison. The show is a show that's sort of obsessed with um, the science and technology being able to solve the mysteries of our times, even the original story by Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and the new updated version kind of frames it so that um, Sherlock is so amazing at what he does because he's so great at um, processing all of the information he gets from the internet. So he becomes kind of like a human translator. Uh, so ultimately, what you um, end up getting in the age of the internet is a uh, a sort of narrative of infinite perspective. You know, if the point of traditional film was to convince you this is one perspective, um, this is all you get, this is reality, um, the, the internet kind of throws a, throws a wrench in that. And this is from the movie Men, Women, and Children, and this is one of the typical scenes um, where you can clearly see lots of people going through their own stories at once. Um, and the idea that everyone can have authorship control is fundamentally at odds with a lot of the ways that movies used to tell stories. The idea was that the filmmaker had um, uh, authorial control. Um, so if everyone has their own cameras, uh, then what is exactly the point of having a single film camera? Um, so you see, I just think this is a funny comparison between, I guess, the way a classic Hollywood romance um, takes place in Pillow Talk and uh, Her, which is sort of a more modern take and he was sort of, you know, like ends up alone with his phone. Um, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much it. It results in the breaking apart of the film narrative as you saw initially. Simple stuff. Simple stuff. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, first of all, I'm really excited to be here. I love theorizing the web, and I love telling people what horror movies I think they should watch. <laughs> so this is a really good day. So yeah, my talk is called It Could Look Like Someone You Know, Trauma Haunting and the Impossibility of the Posthuman in Modern Horror Films. Horror has a long history of engaging with our anxieties regarding technology, our bodies, and ultimately the violence of modernity. When we think about horror films that directly address human relationships to technology, there have been two subgenres that I think really get at this. The first is um, tech body horror, epitomized by the work of David Cronenberg, which if you're like me and you picked your uh, Long Live the New Flesh badge, you can pledge allegiance to him every day. Um, <laughs> But, you know, director of uh, films like Videodrome, The Fly, Existence, but also um, lesser known films like the cyberpunk horror film Tetsuo the Iron Man. These films depict tech very physically as something that collides with the human body and transforms it, often taking it out of a person's control in a really visceral, violent way. The second subgenre lacks such a strict taxonomy as the first category, but uh, for the sake of just getting through this concept, I'll call it ghost in the machine horror. And um, the conceit generally being that a vengeful spirit haunts a device or a machine and uses those machines to gain access to unsuspecting innocent users who would torture psychologically before eventually killing them. Uh, Japanese or J-horror really has this market cornered, um, thinking of films like Ringu or The Ring, I, I picked The Ring because I just like that picture better, uh, One Missed Call and Pulse. More than anything else, these films use tech more as a clever way to give a ghost a new type of vessel by which to reach people essentially making the haunted house mobile, removing the geographical boundaries that confine a haunting, and also eliminating the inevitable question everyone asks during movies like this, which is, but why don't they just leave the house? <laughs> so that's a really general, very simplified purview of this landscape of horror. 
But um, I chose to talk about this subject um, because over the past couple of years, I saw some horror films that really struck me and how they depicted social networks in the way that we currently tend to understand them as something that exists online and in embodied spaces, separate in some ways and overlapping in others. So I'm glad that there was some lead up to Unfriended because I'm going to talk about it a lot. Um, I'm referring to that film and It Follows, both released in 2015, yet both very different. And we can get into the general plots, but up front I'll just say that the entirety of Unfriended, uh, like we already saw, takes place on social networking sites and chat platforms that interface you directly with the world of the film, while It Follows is noticeably devoid of many modern tech, tech devices. But beyond that, I began to feel that these films were wrestling with questions I was asking myself frequently. What does it mean at this point for us to live our lives online, and if the embodied experiences we have and the trauma we experience IRL in real life follow us online, can we ever escape it, and did we ever have a chance in the first place? So for this project, I focused on um, Anne Catherine Hales's critique of the posthuman as explored in her work How We Became Posthuman, and this is a grave oversimplification of the book, but it's, it's really good. Um, and in the text, she takes issue less with the idea of the posthuman itself and more with the mind-body dualist fantasy of the posthuman that arose throughout the history of cybernetics. And a lot of the book is the history of cybernetics. If you're into stuff like that, it's really great. Um, she claims that just because information lost its body, quote unquote, it doesn't mean embodiment is not essential to human being. Our embodied realities and experiences are major components of what makes us human. And that a post-human reality, for most, would just replicate the same oppressive structure that punishes people constantly for their embodied differences and perceived identity differences. And this question of embodiment informs a lot of what we should consider when we think about our lives online, how our digital lives and our embodied lives are not just intertwined but enmeshed, and about who typically gets to move freely online and off without the threat of harm and who does not. It situates the post-human, as Hales implies, as something that, if achievable, is only available to a very privileged set of people. This concept of identity is not informed, or rather entirely formed, by the physical embodied experiences they have because of their bodies and perceived differences. And secondly, I relied heavily on Avery Gordon's Ghostly Matters, Haunting a Sociological Imagination, to help me explore the question, if embodied reality and experiences are so important, what exactly are we taking with us into our digital lives that tethers us to the embodied reality and prevents us from achieving this post-human utopia? Gordon defines haunting, and I'll be using this a lot in this talk, as the one way in which abusive systems of power make themselves known and their impacts felt in daily life. Um, it is an animated state in which a repressed or unresolved social violence is making itself known, sometimes very directly, sometimes more obliquely. She also differentiates between haunting and trauma, claiming that while trauma is something that lingers with us, it's more of an individualistic obstacle, while haunting makes itself known in order to push us to action, to correct a violence that's social and historical. And I just have a quick quote from her here. The ghost is not simply a dead or a missing person, but a social figure, and investigating it can lead to that dense site where history and subjectivity make social life. Being haunted draws us affectively, sometimes against our will and always a bit magically, into the structure or feeling of a reality we come to experience, not as cold knowledge, but as a transformative recognition. So back to these films, in case anyone hasn't seen it, just a really quick plot synopsis. Unfriended takes place, like I mentioned, entirely on a protagonist's laptop screen, and that's the viewer's interface into the world of the film. And we follow the main character. She picks a song to play on Spotify and pokes around on Facebook until she meets her friends in a Skype group chat to discuss buying concert tickets. But there's an extra profile in the group that no one recognizes, a glitch, and they try to remove it to no avail, but don't stress about it too much until they begin receiving messages from the Facebook profile of their friend Laura, who committed suicide a year prior. And then she picks them off one by one, uh, forcing them to reveal all the ways in which they've betrayed one another over the years. It's really great, super underrated movie. Um, <laughs> um, and she instills in them each of the feelings of pain and shame that they'll, that they'll carry with them to wherever they're going next once it's revealed that they're responsible for like the cyberbullying and trolling and uploading an embarrassing video that drove her to kill herself. But the drama the film centers around the characters differentiating between what is or is not a crime based on them perpetuating it online versus off. They maintain a certain innocence and self-righteousness because everyone else was posting nasty things, so we just did it too, or it was just a joke. No one expresses any visible regret until the very end of the film, where Blair, the final person left in the group chat, is revealed to be the person who originally posted this incriminating video, and she apologizes for her role in the tragedy, and is with this one final acknowledgement of the collapse between her embodied life and her digital life that the ghost gets the recognition she seeks, but still dispatches with her anyway, because... <laughs> That's the kind of movie that this is. And um, 
the other film it follows follows a co- <laughs> it follows follows a college student who sleeps with her new boyfriend who then reveals to her that he passed along a sexually transmitted haunting and the haunting takes the form of a person who slowly walks in the direction of the of the haunted and you can go as far away as possible but it eventually reaches her and he tells her it could look like someone you know or a stranger in the crowd anything it can do to get closer to you and the only solution for her is to pass it along to someone else and tell them to do the same and so on and so forth he then drops her in the street outside her house traumatized and shaking in front of her friends when she attempts to evade the haunting and then pass it along via casual sex it eventually comes back to her she later sleeps with her oldest friend the only male character in the film who genuinely cares about her well-being and it's this um gesture of intimacy that keeps the ghost at bay but there is some doubt cast on this so what should we consider the ghosts in each of these films uh within the framework established here i believe the hauntings um, or ghosts act as information and digital channels they are essentially all of the parts of oneself that have been uploaded online our behavior our traumas as well as our keystrokes and locations logged no matter where the haunted escape to and it follows whatever it is locates them for every place they go has their footprint in it somehow their friends houses places that make them feel safe places that are associated with memory or trauma and even as they attempt to give the information a body by trapping it in a pool and shooting it it doesn't really seem to work in the end and it's a i wanted to pick it follows because it i think it gets as like creating a a universe that it itself works as a social network kind of replicating our online spaces even if there's a noticeable lack of technology in the film aside from this really cool e-reader that i really wish existed in real life (laughs) um since i'm running out of time i will skip ahead and just say that um also in unfriended the ghost of laura barnes is essentially information as well It traps the characters by using things only an omniscient data collecting being would know, not what the actual person would know. It locates pressure points from them, forcing the kids to trigger one another into betraying each other. And it's meaningful and it follows that the haunting appears to Jay in forms that touch her consciousness in disturbing ways, generally appearing as people who seem to have been assaulted or as men who look threatening. And it's never revealed what happened to her, but you can tell that it's some form of her subjectivity that has been uploaded online and forcing it to reveal itself over and over again and lastly um another thing that gordon brings up is well what is it that's haunting us and what is it that's carrying this trauma into online spaces and she invokes uh, walter benjamin's idea of um profane illumination and benjamin said that uh profane illumination captures just that experience of a ghostly matter it's telling us something we important that we hadn't known before it's the everyday things in our lives that all of a sudden in new context after surviving something or being going through something reveals itself in a new way and forces us to act so in in films like this it could be a song that invokes someone's guilt an uneaten sandwich left alone in someone's room to collect mold and anything that over the course of course of the films caused them to somehow strike back against this haunting so um in conclusion i think both of these films depict people's attempts to escape in some capacity the constraints of their embodied lives um their shame their guilt their tragedy and most importantly their losing struggle against those who hold uh power over them and attempt to escape into the post-human but ultimately in both of these films that attempt to escape fails and i think that we're going to see more horror movies that explore less about our anxieties regarding technology and um less regarding a uh, technology in the post-human itself and more about what if we're not able to escape into this post-human and what if we cannot escape our embodied realities the way that we were promised that we would in a utopian sense. So I'll just leave you with this quote from Hales. If my nightmare is a culture inhabited by post-humans who regard their bodies as fashion accessories rather than the ground of being, my dream is a version of the post-human that embraces the possibilities of information technologies without being seduced by fantasies of unlimited power and disembodied immortality, that recognizes and celebrates finitude as a condition of human being, and that understands human life is embedded in a material world of great complexity, one of which we depend for our continued survival. So, thanks a lot. (laughs) All right, thank you all so much for being so good about time management because that means we have a lot of time for questions and discussion. So, let me throw it open. Who wants to start? Who has a question? Who has a comment? There's room is packed. You've got to have something to say. Come on. Going directly into the haunted based on the experience of people, evil robots, and so on, I'm curious 
whether, uh, I guess this might be something that you would have commented on your research, whether there's been any overlapping competition about those two things, like the robot in cinema over the past, you know, say 50, 75 years, as an open growth or collecting will have a conversation with itself about the future of story and the speed of knowledge and like how that creates type of all for change. Like I guess, for example, going from the sort of monster robot in the game to Wally, um, which is like a more positive portrayal, but still sort of have a like through that lens, the sort of like, oh, um, if Wally were to be like an open conversation about it with like people of color, be like, oh, um, thank goodness that we have this humble person on the ground reminding us of how great we once were and coming back to our roots. <laughs> That's something that occurs to me watching these back and forth between these two situations in the case of Wally and Woody. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Adilfo. I don't know if it's working. <laughs> no, it's working. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Think so. Um, Adilfo Nama has like, a whole book. A little on closer there. Has a whole book on like black space. That's like I totally draw upon for my race bending talk, and I'm always reminded about like Will Smith is like is the one black sci-fi hero who is like always saving the day but he has to usually like sacrifice himself in some way like race is everywhere in like robot films even if it's not explicitly there it's like there in its structured absence and so like w will smith is the like one black guy who gets to like live and like like jesus he sacrifices <laughs> himself to save us all yeah yeah that's uh, like the most prominent one yeah, this is working, okay. Uh, also on the Will, yeah, Will Smith is, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, like the only uh, black uh, hero in sci-fi. But it's interesting, at the beginning of iRobot, he's so prejudiced towards robots, which I actually kind of find really disturbing, like just making prejudice. He, he actually, in the beginning, he chases a robot that he thinks is stealing a purse, and he has a line that's like, oh, well, you know, you see a robot running with a purse, so... You know what that means. You gotta, I gotta arrest him. Which I, and any and the uh, person whose purse it belongs to, and who the robot belongs to is another black woman, who is just like, what's wrong with you? Uh, this is my robot. I was missing my asthma medication. Like this, no robot can um, uh, commit crimes. It's not in the robot of uh, that Isaac Asimov's uh, robot code, um, which. I mean, I guess he overcomes his prejudice, and maybe that's that's the metaphor, that's the thing that uh, it should never have been there to begin with, but. I think it also speaks to like the self-hating aspect in blackness, and that's what this, the film is speaking about, because also that he has like, his uh, own arm is like robotic. Mm -hmm. So like, even though it's like, he hates robots, he's part robot himself. Right, absolutely. And that was um, like, towards the end of your presentation, like as that thought like, became an earworm of, thinking along the lines of your presentation and then having that as an underlayer listening to yours, um, it was almost kind of like helpful towards the end of like what when you were saying that the robot, the portrayal of robots in current films um, is giving the robots a chance to just exist as themselves and robots and define what that means to them. Mm -hmm. Like if we were to look at that as part of this conversation of like robots have to stand in for a conversation of people of color, when people of color should actually just be Mm -hmm. that that's sort of a hopeful note of self-determining identity. Maybe. Right. Who else? Yeah. In looking at um, the relationship of race bending and screens and, and these various technological concepts being presented in the film, what, what is your take on the relationship between representation and tokenization in each of these concepts? Sorry, can you say like representation and tokenization between like screens? So in the context of race bending, what do you think is the relationship between representation and tokenization? Race bending and tokenization? Yeah, like I think yeah, definitely because one of the like things you have to think about race bending is that it needs to have a whitewash work to, to work against. So you're obviously tokenization is always very present in any any conversation around it. So that like you want to have, like, you're always working against, like, o against a white text. 
and like you so that's like the it'll be interesting to see like I don't know I feel like more examples of race bending are like doing it whitewash text instead of like um, in between different races I don't know, sorry I'm, I don't know if that answer your question or <laughs> sure. okay Who else? Thought? Comment? Yeah. Um, yeah my question is uh, for Grace. So I'm, I'm interested in sort of uh, correlations between some of the trajectories we're seeing in cinema mm -hmm. and the inception of various uh, paradigms around technology um, in our own world. And um, the, your, your sort of summarizing point about the, the trend that we're seeing right now, um, it seems like one of those trends we're seeing on screen um, is um, the idea of the, the feminized body, right? And, and the robotic, and I'm wondering if you think there's some sort of correlation between the things that we're seeing in terms of like Alexa uh, and Siri, right? And the way that we are sort of trying to, in some ways, give shape to this conception of uh, a feminized identity in relation to our technology. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, uh, tr sadly, uh, traditionally, uh, female robots have tend to be like sex well no I shouldn't say sadly that's not fair but like they're sex bots they're they're for pleasure models um fembots is you know a continuation of that with a little bit of edge but uh with uh ex machina uh we have you know Ava which is uh I th I'm trying to think if there's any really other f like strong female robot characters well Dolores in Westworld but uh yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think I think uh, we're just finally getting a, a woman robot's perspective. That sounds uh, bizarre, but uh, uh, yeah, which because they have been, especially like in the '80s, traditionally male. Even if there's no reason, often robots are often gendered for no reason. Also, they're they there's just no reason for it. Um, so, and they're often gendered male uh, across the board. So, uh, yeah, I think I think we will see a lot more powerful female robots. I, I hope that, <laughs> and I think Alexa and Siri, since we're talking to, I guess, powerful female robots, is definitely contributing to that want as a culture. Yeah, in the back. So that was that was me. Um, this is fine. Yeah, 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 it's working. Um, so I think the idea is less that um, I think you're right. Like people love to have a single narrative. Like that's the way we we think about things and communicate and and tell stories. Um, I think the thing with the internet though is when you have an interactive screen, it allows everybody to sort of pick and choose their own narrative. So for example, if you look at like an episode of Modern Family where you see the whole thing happen on a computer screen. You know, what really is the difference between seeing that computer screen that a filmmaker like screenshot and put together and going on the internet and sort of like navigating your own narrative? Like you can choose and pick like clips of your own to see and therefore kind of put your own story together. Um, so I think it's it's not so much that like, I think you're right, like no medium can, can really capture the sort of fragmented nature of our experience, but something that the computer allows you to do is it allows everybody to sort of put together their own narrative and everybody puts it together a little differently. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Um, <laughs> You cannot solve gender with post-humanity. <laughs> can't solve a lot of things with post-humanity. But um, yeah, I mean, there's so much more I would have liked to say with a little bit more time that got lost. But I don't think it's any accident that um, in these, you know, film and not just horror films in general, but in these films in particular, it's you know, 
trauma and like experiences of vulnerability that are like women's experiences and I mean also horror is really whitewashed too and I don't know there's so many other stories that could get as that as well I would argue that get out is also something that kind of looks at social networks in a similar way but that movie was not out when I wrote this <laughs> uh, paper but yeah um yeah I don't really know what to say other than like I think it's totally you know intentional and you know these are both male directors who made these films and it's easier to put like not just an imperiled imperiled women but also like and it follows jay is like a she's a college age girl and then over the course of the film the places that she goes within her social network to get help or like the ice cream parlor where her friends are working or like there's really her being like a 20 year old is kind of incidental because most of the film she spends time in pajamas with like a cast on her arm and she kind of reads like a child and i don't know yeah i think both of these films kind of like infantilize the experiences of young women but those are also like the parts that they share of themselves that get like uploaded online does that make sense at all <laughs> yeah Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Like, even if you look at the films right now that are portraying the internet, it almost seems like they wish they could be like forms of web media. So I think the most the simplest version of that is short form video that you see on the web, where you choose what clips to watch, you choose what order you watch them in. And the more advanced version of that is obviously like 360 video and virtual reality video, like the things that are happening at Oculus. So you already see a lot of um, creative people like creating narratives for those kinds of medias and um, I feel like we haven't even really begun to um, to kind of explore like what does narrative look like when it surrounds you like in a 360 context and when it's personalized and when it's interactive like where are the places that narrative is still going to like differ from like real experiences there is also um, there is a horror movie it's not good <laughs> but <laughs> it's um it's called sick house and it was released as a snapchat story did anyone hear about this and it was in partnership with like a popular youtube star and i i don't know a lot of youtube stars so i don't know who she is but she had a, a ton of followers and she you know partnered with this um uh production company that like helped her shoot a horror movie and she kind of tricked her followers into thinking that she was going to this cabin in the woods with her friends for the weekend so if you followed her instagram story the movie unfolded in real time and if it was better done, you might think that it was real, but <laughs> <laughs> but there's like there's totally like an opportunity for like new media to capture those stories. Misinformation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think it'll be very interesting to see the remake of Blair Witch Project. Now yeah. that it's sort of a web-based mm -hmm. media. I think that'll touch upon a lot of what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I was really afraid that you were gonna tell me that like you made Sick House and that's <laughs> why you <laughs> But if you haven't seen Unfriended, I think it's a really impressive example of something that like very accurately represents like how how people interface with online platforms and it's the only movie that I could recommend like you should watch it on your laptop to get the full experience but it feels like so natural and like voyeuristic it really is like someone shared their screen with you um, 
but there's I mean there's tons of like painful examples of like people like texting in movies and TV shows that like doesn't always land and with horror it's kind of tricky because I feel like it really wants to stray from those technological aspects and I think that's why it's like taken so long for some films to address the things that I was talking about and like catching up so to speak to like our digital and online lives merging yeah just that what that got me thinking of was the explosion of found footage films a while ago because that's what people were thinking about and now kind of seeing where that's going to transition to that's interesting if we're going to get out of here on time I think we have time for one or two more in the way that marketing and previews of content end up having a pretty wide um, shadow nowadays and, and a wide capacity to go viral and, and spread before even the um, information comes out. I, I mean, like a good example of this is like Ghost in the Shell casting or even the like preemptive um, suggestions that like Donald Glover should uh, be the next Spider-Man and like the backlash that followed that. But then I mean it also just inherently relates to the images of technology on screen and the ways in which they like can seem outdated before they even uh, appear on screen. I mean I guess uh, and this is a larger question about the media landscape as a whole but like what uh, how can people who are making things preempt this, the kind of like obsolescence or just general, you know, backlash towards things before they're even seen. And um, I mean, that's a little bit more general, but yeah. So I think there's two things that like immediately come to my mind that are happening there. The first is sort of the universal authorship that the web allows everyone. Like when you can Google this movie's being made and you can look at IMDb and you can look at actors' histories, like everybody feels like they want to and should have a voice, especially when you can even reach out to directors on Twitter. Um, I think the other thing that is happening there is N like in this age of like hyper like mixed media narrative becomes sort of displaced from like any sort of medium so like the story of um uh, i don't know like a ghost in the shell which um I, I don't know too much about it's it's a story that's separate from the actual movie being made like we have so many remakes nowadays that you have the story and then you have the film being made but outside of that you have the, the characters existing on like social media through marketing you have like short versions of the movie of like alternative versions alternate endings and all of this that sort of drags out the the narrative to be in this space that's um kind of untethered to any specific form uh, so that's why i feel like we we like live in a world where we're like immersed in in all of these narratives um that sort of everybody has uh feels like they have a right to to help tell and i think really fandom facilitates that like the author is dead and we all have ownership in it uh, through that like sort of like engagement of being like I invested so much in myself into this character that this actor should become it even if they themselves don't want to become it and I think like the, the technical solution to casting notice <coughs> is just like more like explicitly saying that actors of color can be in the casting notices because that racefunding.com started as a protest because like it was only Caucasians that as like the leads was like the I think the quote from the casting notice so, like, that whole campaign started from just seeing a casting notice. Yeah, and to go off of your presentation, something interesting that happens with um, online video in general is, it, like, the internet gives minorities a way to sort of organize and ask for representation. And something you see in internet video in particular is the big stars coming out of places like YouTube, like Facebook video, um, et cetera. They tend to be uh, um, less homogenous than traditionally the type of stars that come out of come out of Hollywood, partly because the internet, uh, you know, a view is a view no matter who it comes from. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have time for one more super quick one. Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, because you already got one. I think I saw another hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast with Neil Stevenson recently, and he said a quote that resonated with me, and I saw some themes from your talks, so I was wondering if you could respond to it. He basically said that one of the reasons he thought that utopic narratives were overshadowed by dystopic narratives was that it was easy to create a dystopic narrative. It didn't take that much infrastructure because, you know, you just go into a desert and there's like some sparse, um, decrepit, aging, uh, you know, set pieces.
is it's, it's much easier to do that than to re-envision what a utopic society might look like and build these sets and um, you know, include the renderings and other types of post-production into the movie. Um, and so I, I saw this theme of like technology as a driver and it leading to opportunities or sometimes challenges um, in narratives. I was wondering if each of you could respond to um, what the opportunities you saw in your work um, as it relates to, uh, I guess, this thematic of, of tech as a progress or maybe even um, as something that is an anxiety ridden problem. If each of you are going to respond, you got to keep it to like 20 <laughs> seconds <laughs> or I'm going to get in trouble with the rest of the committee. Okay, I can just be quick. Uh, yes, totally. Um, I think that like good fan fiction should like rein in your dystopian impulse to just be like, uh, there are no, like everything terrible is gonna happen because that's not the lived experience of like most people of color. It like ha holds ambiguities and contradictions. Like we're all contradictory people and like the best ones like really delve into like historical bodily, like institutional context to make the story as real as our lived ones. And so that is like, the that is the most successful examples of like finding a happy medium between dystopians and utopians. So I think maybe the goal is not to make one or the other, but to find something that's most reflective of our own lived reality. I think, well, one quick thing I could add is I think there is a lot of anxiety within creative classes with regards to technology. The people making technology or in control of it are rarely filmmakers and writers and artists. So. There, I think the tendency is to mistrust it because the people who are making it, computer programmers, software engineers, like they're not the ones creating these movies. I mean, horror is tricky because it's, you know, there's not a lot of utopia to be found in it, but really quickly, I think like what I kind of got at in doing my research is um, like what to stray from that maybe like reliance on like trying to figure out how to become post-human, trying to figure out a, a way to you know forget our historical memory is not helpful that you know preserving your historical memory like matters preserving like what haunts people and traumatizes people matters to help us figure out where to go and like build a new future um, just really quickly, I don't know, you mentioned sets a lot, and that that's actually what I do is my job. Um, so I don't know if you mean like uh, building sets literally, because I would argue that dystopias are way more complicated to build than utopias. And I, I mean, look at Blade Runner, like it's just, that's a lot of work to do. So I, I think it's a, it's a, 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 a question of conflict. Um, to what, where's the conflict in a utopia? Where's the narrative going to come from? I think that's why we see more dystopias than utopias. All right, thank you all so much. This was absolutely fantastic. If you want to continue the conversation with our lovely panelists, look for them through the rest of the conference. And yeah, thank you all again.